Coco Mall. Está comiendo. Welcome to the <laughs> Charles Bukowski <laughs> Centenary Virtual Symposium. I think we've collected the greatest group of panelists mm -hmm. to talk about Bukowski, and I'll be introducing them all to you shortly. My name is Kurt Hemmer. I teach American literature at Harper College. And before we get started, I'd just like to thank all the people involved in helping us put this together. Uh, the first people I'd like to thank uh, are the Cultural Arts Committee who helped fund this. Yeah. And then I'd also like to thank uh, Dave DeLuger and the marketing department and Sue Borchek for helping us put this up on the Harper website for you guys to enjoy. And now I'd like to introduce our panel. The first person we have on the panel um, coming from San Francisco, California, is one of the great living poets in the United States, Neely Tchaikovsky. Could you repeat that? <laughs> and these Not are joking. Joking. These are his, and these are his books, part of my collection. This is from 1975. This is Waters Reborn. Mm. From 1976, Public Notice. From 1981, Love Proof. From 1984, Clear Wind. Oh. From 1988, this is the 88 edition of Whitman's Wild Children. Uh -huh. This is the 1991 special signed edition of his biography. Hank, and I Who's was, that? this is one that is signed by Charles Bukowski and Neely. Nice. This is the 1996 edition of Animal. Also from 1996, Elegy for Bob Kaufman. Mm. From 2004, Leaning Against Time. From 2011, From the Middle Woods. From 2018, Elegy for My Beat Generation. Yeah, yeah. You keep getting, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Looking. Wow. <laughs> And here's the latest book from 2020. Hang on to the Yangtze River. And last but not least, Indeed. <laughs> the centennial edition of your biography. Now, it now had I to have... end with Bukowski. But, but let me show one you last quick. special thing for you. I want to see if you remember these. Oh, oh, nice. I have Last read. literary. Hey, Kurt, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Hank called me up one night and he said, we're going to do a magazine. I met a friend from high school. He's very wealthy. We're going to call it the Contemporary Review, a non-snob compilation of active creativity. I said, come on, Hank. You can do better than that. Two uh days later... Two in the morning, two days later. Hello, it's Bukowski. Laugh Literary and Man the Humping Guns. Hatchet Man Press. I said, now nah, you've done it. So we did three issues, but we fought too much. We had too many fights. And uh, he would put the magazine on my <laughs> front lawn. And I put it on his. And we wrote a couple of poems together, which we put in the magazine. It was a small event. If I knew, if I known what would happen to him, I would have kept doing it. You know, I mean, Jesus Christ. So one last thing, Kurt, I'd just like to show. I did Elegy for Bob Kaufman recently for City Lights. I co-edited The Collected Poems of Bob Kaufman. It's an extremely great book. 
everybody should have, and I'm very proud of that. And City Lights gave me the original manuscript that I'm going to sell to the Bancroft Library, so I'm even happier. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. I'm going to read, actually, just something that Steve Richmond says about you in his book. So Steve Richmond writes, Nearly spent more time with Bukowski than anyone else back in those middle 60s. He slept over at Bukowski's place for weeks at a time. <laughs> they were real drinking pals. Yeah. Neely has the closest personal experience with Charles Bukowski of any writer on earth. So we're really pleased to have you on this panel, Neely. And what I'd like to ask you is, do you remember when you first realized that you were in the presence of a great writer when you were with Charles Bukowski. Do you remember when you first came to that understanding? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, as I said, I was 16 and I'd been reading so much like a lot of 16 year old writers and aspiring writers. And although I always say, once you pick up a pen, you're not an aspiring writer, you're a writer. But I was a beginner and I started appearing in magazines. One day Bukowski called me up and he said, listen, kid, you're crowding me out of the magazines. <laughs> now, that says a lot about him. I didn't realize John Martin told me 30 years later, you know, he saw you and not just me. And all you young guys, he saw you as his peers. He did not look down on you despite the bluster, despite the whatever. This man was so open. I knew right away that I was with somebody special. He wrote, this thing upon me is not death, but it's as real. And as landlords full of maggots pound for rent, I eat walnuts in the sheath of my privacy and listen for more important drummers. Now that's from a poem written in 59 called Old Man Dead in the Room. How can you read that and have any kind of sensitivity and not kind of get the chills? And, you know, I'd been told by a, a young man who showed up at my parents' bookstore in San Bernardino, there's a guy in LA who goes to Santa Anita. He wears dark glasses and he's about to have his first book out. Flower fished and bestial whale, and that was Hank. So, yeah, I think it was instant uh, hero worship of a kind. And it took years to change that. When I saw that he was my friend, when I saw how accessible he was and how he would ask as many questions as I would, that said a lot to me. Well, you know, he wrote and wrote on that machine of mm. his every goddamn day. I didn't do that. He sent out all the time. I had to be roped to send things out. And after 75 years, I realized I was lazy. So don't be lazy. If you're a writer, be like Bukowski. And, and I mean, you have to be talented. And he knew he had it because he was always laughing. He was always happy. He was always satisfied. How many times I would knock on the door. Oh, shit, I'd hear. <laughs> and he'd answer it. And he says, good God, man, you broke the rhythm. Come on in. And then three days would go by. We'd be drinking and we'd go to the Pioneer Chicken on Sunset. And he would never get out of the car because the Hell's Angels hung out there. So I had to go out and get this, you know, a ton of dripping fries and, and what have you. And then we go back to that little place on the long prey that is now a shrine. So yeah, Kurt, right from the beginning, he was special and he's still special to me in many ways, but you know, between the decades competition whatever, between all these things that make us human, that make us into great men or fuck-ups or great women, uh, you come to different conclusions. I knew him as a, 
as, as a young writer worshiping his writing, I knew him as a friend. I knew him as a co-worker on a magazine. Uh, I, what, I knew him when he was famous. I knew him after he died. And I still know his writing. So I knew him in many different ways. And uh, uh, I don't do it. Would, would I say I hero worship him now? No, I, I admire him so much. He's one of the writers that made this world uh, extraordinary. And just to say that alone, that puts him with Neruda, with Garcia Lorca, with Rainer Maria Rilke, with Frederick Holderlin. That puts him with all of them, with Ezra Pound, with Elliot. It just puts him right up there. Isn't that enough? Isn't that beautiful? So I'm glad we're doing this. Okay, enough. Yeah, thank you. It's a great honor to have you here. Now I'd like to introduce uh, David Stephen Kalan, who in my opinion is the top Bukowski scholar in the United States. He's coming to us from Ann Arbor, Michigan. In 2003, he edited Sunlight, Here I Am. In 2008, Portions from a Wine-Stained Notebook. <laughs> yeah, right. That's it. In 2010, Absence of the Hero. Yeah, yeah. In 2011, More Notes of a Dirty Old Man. Yeah. In 2012, uh, one of the best books on... Charles Bukowski, part of the Critical Lives series. And in 2015, The Bell Tolls for No One. And in 2018, The Mathematics of the Breath and the Way. So thank you for joining us, David. And David, can you... Uh, can you tell me um, what was it that compelled you to become uh, such a great scholar of Bukowski's work? Uh, I, actually, I think the first exposure I had to him was uh, the Taylor ha Hackford uh, documentary that played on public television in 1973, KCE right. uh, in Los Angeles. And I believe that was the first time I heard of him. I was 21 years old and a, no, I was 20 years old. <laughs> I was undergrad at UCLA and I had been reading, you know, Kerouac and E.E. E. Cummings and Dostoevsky. And uh, suddenly this, well, actually there's more to it. I, you know, Los Angeles is interesting because as Neely well knows, uh, Los Angeles was uh, sort of poo-pooed by, uh, the cultural yeah. uh, uh, martinets of American culture. You know, that we're sort of a, a backwater. And uh, the fact is, of course, that Aldous Huxley lived in L.A., uh, Arnold Schoenberg. Um, yeah. The uh, fuck? Uh, 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 for a while, uh, Theodore Adorno was there, Bertolt Brecht, but uh, Stravinsky. And there were uh, many great intellectual geniuses in L.A., but I think what struck me maybe in seeing that biography on TV was, my God, uh, we have a living one here. Because I, I think I had an immediate positive reaction to Bukowski from that, from that film. I was trying to remember, I may have read him a bit in the LA Free Press at that time. I can't quite remember if I did or not, but I, I am sure I saw that documentary. And my first impressions were, this man is an extremely sensitive creature. <laughs> he's... He's, uh, I think, a genius. Uh, and I, I think the themes that came out in that documentary were his, his driven kind of uh, relationship to creativity, that he was always, uh, he, he was a creative man. And, uh, and also then the weaving in and out of the passionate uh, love story of the women in his life and the and even the, I was trying to think of the proper word, I almost think violence 
or or power. I'm not quite sure, but there was a there's a kind of combination in him between this extreme sensitivity and 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 violence. I don't know if that's the right word still, but it's kind of emotional power and 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 or maybe madness. Maybe and I think one thing I think for me was I'd also been reading Nietzsche when I was 17. I read Birth of Tragedy and again Dostoevsky, and so I I, I think that this this theme of the creative solitary person who is burdened with suffering yeah. <laughs> who is also at the same time able <laughs> to translate that through creative means was a very powerful thing. And I think because that was so vivid to me, that's maybe why I, I, I was so struck by him. I think it, 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 it connected all these themes that were in my own adolescence between, uh, you know, music, creativity, madness, falling in love, you know, sexual passion. Uh, I don't want to say loneliness, but solitude, a kind of existential feeling that, you know, we're, we're, we're alone in the world and we're trying to reach out to, to make some contact with something in the world. So I think all those things struck me. And I, I think then I, I went to Austin, I went to grad school at, at Texas, and then uh, I started reading Love is a Dog from Hell and, uh, uh, and I, I read all of his books, basically, because I started to see all these connections between those themes, I think, maybe creativity, love, madness, uh, solitude, and a, maybe a theme we'll talk about later, sort of existential, and this sounds pompous and academic, I don't know how to, I don't want it to sound that way, but existential means, in my mind, that we're basically alone in our quest for, for meaning, right? And Bukowski... He didn't rely on any external thing, no church, no government, no salvation except himself. And I think that theme of trying to find meaning by yourself is what struck me also. Well, so thank I, you so much for joining us and, come, and uh, being part of this panel. Not only do we have the top scholar from the United States, we also have the top Bukowski scholar from Europe and also the foremost translator of Bukowski's uh, poetry. Uh, his name is Abel de Brito, and he is coming to us from Santa Cristina d'Aro. Buenas <laughs> noches, <laughs> Abel. Good night. Buenas noches, my friend. And these are some of the works that um, Abel has worked on. This is one of the outstanding Scholarly works on Charles Bukowski. It's called Charles Bukowski, King of the Underground. Came out in 2013. In 2015, he edited Bukowski on writing. In 2015, this is my favorite on cats. I'm a cat yeah. lover myself. In 2016, on love. Also from 2016, <clears throat> The Essential Bukowski. In 2017, Storm for the Living and the Dead. And in 2019, On Drinking. So welcome to the panel, <laughs> Bell. And uh, you. tell us... Um, how did someone who was born in the Canary Islands and lives in Spain uh, become fascinated with a Angelino poet, Charles Bukowski? Oh, thank you, Kurt. Um, I'm here in Santa Cristina de Aro tonight in Spain. And uh, the thing about this, I, I like to... Um, um, bring something up is when uh, when I first began reading Bikowski, I was about maybe 17 or 18, like David said before, but I read him in translation, not in English. At the time, I didn't know much English, so I, I read him in translation. And let me tell you, there's a huge difference between reading him in translation, and then in the original English. It's like reading Neruda or Gar Garcia Marquez in English, and I'm sure the English translators are great, but, I mean, you cannot compare that to reading them in, wow. the, in the original. Neely probably wow. knows this. So there's a difference. 
So the same thing happened to me uh, with Bukowski back in the day when I was 17 or 18. I was in college, and what happened was I was reading all the beats, and also like David, I was reading all the philosophers that I liked, like Nietzsche and uh, Schopenhauer and so on. Although to me, the philosophers were like on a different kind of league, and uh, the, the beats and, and Bukowski were in a totally different league. Although some of the topics and subjects, you know, they kind of uh, cross over a little bit. But uh, to me, they were different. And when I was reading him, Bikowski, even though in translation, and uh, I had this feeling and, and I thought, this guy is different. Mm. He's, he is very different to Kerouac. He's very different <laughs> to Ginsburg. He's very different to all great. the beats. I mean, they're all yeah. good. They're all great. But there is a difference there. I can feel it. Maybe I was very young. I was only 17 or 19. I, I, and I was not able, I don't think I was able to put that feeling into words. It was just a feeling that this guy is different. And that, and that, that he had this kind of a special light. Yeah. That, that, and, and, and of course, Kerouac, you know, Kurt, he's a uh, Kerouac. Eric scholar, I think, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and Ginsburg, and, and I love the, their work, and it's beautiful, and it's great, but when you are very young at the time, and I had this, again, this feeling and, and that I couldn't put into words, that there was something very unique about his writing, and his, uh, like David said before, his sensitivity. It was very unique, and that was, I, I guess, one of the main reasons that really uh, made me, you know, connect with the, with this work, and I still feel that way. You know, I'm way older now, um, uh, but I still feel this connection, and I still feel his work is unique and special, and it has is his own special, unique light. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, sure. And, um, it's now my honor to introduce you from uh, Bomberg, Germany, uh, Roni. And Roni is uh, the person who is in charge of the Bukowski uh, Gesellschaft, um, the Bukowski Society in Germany. And so I want to say, uh, Guten Abend, Roni. Good Abend, Kurt. Hello, everybody. And what uh, inspired you to become um, someone who uh, has spent so much time uh, learning about Bukowski? I would say of all the people that I've met, um, there are very few people who know more uh, about Charles Bukowski than you do. Um, yeah. I was able to talk to uh, um, Roni before and he knows all the minutia all the details about charles bukowski very impressive um and his uh bukowski society is really excellent and i encourage everyone to check it out how did you get involved in bukowski's work um well like like many others i've uh, been first reading bukowski at the age of 16 around that and um, of course, I was uh, attracted by his uh, anti-establishment um, attitude, uh, anti-society values, uh, anti-authority, uh, this, this um, rebel attitude. Um, but it was more than that. Uh, for, from the beginning, even at age 16, I saw the deeper side of him. Like uh, what I what I used to call uh, existentialism, um, the the deep uh, suffering from the uh, conditio humana, the human condition, the uh, the way we treat each other, and uh, like uh, the um, not being able to to follow the demands of society and. Uh, seeing it as an, I don't know, is imposition the right word of it, for it, uh, of society, um, you know, not wanting to, to be part of this and 
suffering from it. And um, well, yeah, I thought I felt this was the, the true essence of Bukowski and not all this uh, sex and booze image. So uh, this, this is the reason why I never had to outgrow him. I know a lot of people who, uh, who said uh, they, they stopped reading him in the early 20s um, because um, they were attracted uh, to him when, when they were young because of, you know, all this sex and rebellion, uh, rebellion thing. Um, but I never had to outgrow uh, of that because I always sensed this other side of him, this, this deeper side, maybe a kind of dark side. Thank you so much for joining our panel. It's a real honor. Thanks. And then the person who I'm most excited to have on this panel, um, Charles Bukowski's daughter, Marina, is joining us from Nevada, California. Nevada. <laughs> I want to uh, put up a few pictures from this really excellent book by Howard Sounds. And Marina, I'd like you to just tell us a little bit about the pictures as I go through them. This first one, I believe, is of you and your mother. Right, that was near where Hank lived in Hollywood. Notice I turned my mom's hair white already. <laughs> Here we have you as um, it looks as a a young girl, a teenager on the phone. Typical. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that one's the worst. The the engineering picture. I think that the one in the middle is really how I looked for most of my life. If I was in the back seat of the car. You know, if I was with my dad and Linda, once in a while he'd say, are you okay back there, kid? Because I was very quiet, very shy. I'm still very shy. So this experience is a little stressful, but I'm with friends. So thank you for being <laughs> did with your me. Did your teenage friends want to party with you because they felt that uh, your dad would let you go out and drink? No, they had no idea who my dad was for the most part, but um, I did get accused of stealing a wine bottle from a liquor store, which was basically the corner market for us. And yeah, there he is so thin because he had tuberculosis that year that I got married. So I think that the um, accusation of the wine bottle, oh, and there's my baby boy. Someone gave me a, a baseball outfit for the kid because they figured he'd never get one. Otherwise, I'm not a sports person. So my dad I had stolen the wine, as did my mom. I wasn't a wild kid. I was a shy kid. So I had to grow up a bit more than that. Do you remember um, when you realized your dad was an important writer? Do you remember when that was or how old you were? No, because I was brought up by my mom to, um, you know, just I always took it for granted that he was a genius because that's what my mom taught me. So I knew that before I... <laughs> knew how to read or could comprehend that there's other people with opinions about his writing. Yeah. Um, my wife doesn't teach my kids that I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> I wish she did. Well, Pretty good. She, she always taught me that. Of course, they weren't together except for when I was young. Um, but uh, they all very positive about each other and she especially she did teach me that he was a genius so I was just surprised when I realized that other people knew about him too well thank you so much for joining our panel I'm really excited and uh, to start off the first thing I want to ask um, the panel to discuss um, 
has to do with uh, uh, Bukowski's place um, in our 21st century society. His books are all in print. They continue to sell. Um, looking up for <clears throat> signed editions, I notice that they're uh, very expensive. They outsell all his contemporaries, as far as I can tell. Uh, people continue to steal his books from libraries, which is a good sign. I notice a lot of bookstores keep his Bukowski's books in a separate area close to the cash register um, so that people can't steal them from the bookstores. And good things. But he is excluded um, from a lot of anthologies. As a matter of fact, he was initially in the Norton uh, postmodern um, anthology of poetry. And then in the second edition, they took him out. Is this something that um, we should be concerned about as scholars and fans of Charles Bukowski? Does it matter if you're in the major anthologies or not? And I wanted to start with um, Abel and ask, uh, in Spain, uh, does Charles Bukowski get anthologized? And is that something that you even care about? Uh, that's a that's a great question, Kurt. Um, I'll try to keep it short because otherwise it's going to be two a.m. <laughs> We're going to be talking here nonstop because we like to talk here. So I like to to be concise. Uh, I think here in Spain, hap the same happens uh, that uh, you, you just said about the USA. There is no. Um, major anthology where you can find Bukowski. He is in pretty much in a bunch of uh, small press anthologies like in the USA. And let me tell you, in the USA, he's in quite a few anthologies all over the years from the 70s up to today. But mostly we're talking about small press or minor anthologies, not like the Norton um, maybe Penguin and some others, but not many. So, but same thing here goes in Spain. It's like uh, he's not part of the let's let's say the canon, you know. And uh, but personally, if I, if you are asking about my personal opinion, I couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. That's my personal opinion. I couldn't care less. I think he's still very popular, nonetheless. And as you were saying before, his books are being stolen from uh, from libraries, from bookshops, because uh, he's very popular uh, among the new generations. Um, maybe not because of the right reasons, because I think he's popular mainly because of that image, like Ronnie was saying before, the dairy old man, that this persona that he... Uh, he liked to, in a way, to uh, kind of exploit in the 70s when he was becoming more and more popular and giving poetry readings. And he knew that, and he knew he could, he could make some money out, out of that. He was a smart guy. He was no fool. He knew this persona was, uh, you know, giving him money. But at the same time, he was writing all the other stuff. Again, the, uh, to me, the, the real man persona, this kind of writing that made him popular is the tip of the iceberg is one percent one percent maybe two percent of his output there's the other 98 percent which is great and beautiful and deep and insightful and it's not the dairy old man persona and but sadly in a way sadly he became popular because of that tiny little one or two percent of his output and again if you're asking me about here in Spain about anthologies, no, the same thing that, that in the States. He's not in any major anthology, just, you know, very small, uh, small, small press uh, projects. And uh, that's the way it is. But personally, I don't care. I think he's going to be there nonetheless because he's still popular for the reasons that I'm saying and many other reasons that you guys are going to talk about, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh Roni, it's my understanding that uh, Charles Bukowski is more popular in Germany than he is in the United States. 
does he get into the anthologies in Germany? Well, he is present in a lot of anthologies, but not in the literary anthologies like the Norton anthology or something like that. Um, they are like uh, books that, that come out for, you know, the reader on the street with uh, not, not much, um, you know, uh, not, not looking for literary quality. Uh, maybe Bukowski would have liked that. Um, I would like to see him in, in uh, literary anthologies and um, uh, in universities uh, more. Um, and they are opening. Uh, Bukowski is not so much a uh, bestseller in, in Germany anymore as he was in the 70s and 80s. Um, he's still read, absolutely. He, he always finds his audience, um, but uh, he's not selling in the millions, you know, mm -hmm. uh, anymore, uh, like, like he used to. But um, the uh, academic world and scholarly world uh, has begun to um, realize the quality of his literature. I mean, I mean, okay, Bukowski would, wouldn't care about it. He would say, oh, no, don't talk about literature. And, you know, I, when I write, I want uh, people to have blood and feel the raw and something like that. Um, but I care about him uh, being recognized by, by scholars. Uh, I mean, there are PhD theses written about him. Abba has written his. Um, the city of Los Angeles has uh, a dedicated uh, a place where he lived to be a cultural heritage. This is the status that the Hollywood sign has. Um, the Huntington Library um, houses his uh, um, in heritage, uh, his, his, uh, uh, all, all his works. And this, this is a nice thing. You know, when, uh, when it uh, came public, uh, in 2006, it's a nice anecdote uh, that uh, the Huntington would get the, um, the the works of Charles Bukowski in their shelves together with Shakespeare and Chaucer and all of these established literature guys. Uh, there was an outcry in the conservative media. And uh, then the curator of literary manuscripts at the Huntington, Sue Hudson, great person, uh, she, she uh, wrote a press release stating, we simply collect the best in English and American literature and Charles Bukowski fits in. That was a statement. Since <laughs> then, you, you cannot uh, <laughs> claim anymore he's not important because you will never find a not important author in the shelves of the, or the archives of the hunting. Mm -hmm. And um, you can still dislike him. Okay, sure, it's a, it's a matter of taste. Uh, but you can not deny anymore that he was an important author. Thanks. Um, David, you and I teach college classes. Uh, Mikowski's not in the ninth edition of the Norton Anthology. He's not in the seventh edition of the Heath Anthology. Like I said, he's been taken out of the postmodern Norton. Is this a concern of yours at all as an educator? David. You're talking to me? David. Oh, David, sorry. Yeah. As an educator, does that, does that bother you at all? Uh, especially since in the United States, a lot of people, I think, don't even read poetry unless they're assigned it in college classes. So if he's not going to be in anthologies, um, how are people even going to encounter his work in the first place? Yeah, this opens up this question of canon formation, which people have written about. I mean, it's my father, I remember when I was a teenager, he said, you know, back in the 40s, it was fashionable to wear coats with wide lapels and the ties were, I forgot now, whether they were wider or narrower than they were in the 60s. And he, he talked about it as fashion. I, I think that the, the, the forces that make a work into a classic or considered uh, canonical, they're very complicated. And I, I actually... For example, I was thinking this morning, I was thinking about what I would say about this question. Edgar Allan Poe was not considered a major American writer, you know, and Baudelaire in France translated him and thought highly of him. Faulkner, uh, who won the Nobel Prize, there's their are essays in the 40s by Camus and Sartre. They lionized Faulkner before he became a, 
remember when I was a kid, Hemingway was the great American novelist. And then Hemingway's reputation has fallen, now Faulkner. So I think it's something like that with literature. And I don't see any... These, and my grandfather used to say, de gustibus non est disputandum. You cannot argue about taste. You know, how do you prove uh, why Bach is better than Mozart? I used to agonize this as a teenager. <laughs> this a, I'm playing Bach on the piano. I love Bach. And uh, yet, but I like the Beatles. So am I going to say Bach is better than the Beatles? Well, he is better <laughs> in some ways, but he's, he's a different kind of composer. So I think... Um, I think it doesn't matter really because uh, people find, oh, the other question I wanted to bring up quickly is the idea of a cult writer. You give me I think that Bukowski is considered, is in a lot of these books about cult authors. And Tolkien, what about Tolkien? He's a, they're authors that people gravitate towards that are not, uh, that have not yet been canonized. And I don't, I don't, and the other maybe finally question is, who gets to decide who's canonized? And in America, for example, you probably know Harold Bloom. He, he died recently as a famous scholar at Yale. He wrote essays about why Hart Crane is so wonderful. And he used to poo-poo Eliot and uh, Pound. And he would put Hart Crane up there on the pedestal. Uh, I don't know. How much difference does that make to people that Harold Bloom says Hart Crane is a great poet? I always loved Hart Crane, you know, but in a way, I, I suppose it's a kind of collision between university people and then uh, and what else? I don't know. I guess you guys can talk about it more, but I, I, it's a puzzle to me, actually. Soroyan, who I wrote my first book about, I love Soroyan. He's not in the anthologies. Soroyan influenced Bukowski and Kerouac. Where is Soroyan? He's, he disappeared. He was in my high school anthology in Thousand Oaks, California, a great play called The Oyster and the Pearl, which moved me. And Time of Your Life and the wonderful early short stories yeah. of Soroyan. Daring Young Man on the Flying Trapeze, he's gone. Why? He's Armenian. I don't know. And also then, uh, last thing, uh, uh, the, 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 the shift towards ethnicity, right? Black writers suddenly are popular. Uh, Native American, that's all fine. I'm all for it. But in a way, maybe maybe Bukowski is a working class writer. Maybe that's why he's been uh, excluded, right? He's in that category of, you know, lower class, working class, right? So anyway, a big topic. <laughs> yeah, I think we now live in a time in the United States where the tastemakers are going to be more academics when you have a public that's going to no longer buy poetry for fun. Um, so when I talk to my students, almost none of them go out and buy poetry just for fun. They only, the only encounter with poetry is because the professor asks them to do it, and then maybe a professor turn them on to it, and then they become poetry enthusiasts. Marina, um, do you think your dad cared about whether or not he would be canonized and his works would be put side by side with uh, his heroes like Ezra Pound and Robinson Jeffers? I don't know. We never talked about him being anthologized. Right. You know that in person, in real life, yeah. he didn't want to associate with other writers. He didn't want to spend a lot of time discussing writing and examining and changing what he had written. Um, I think he might have been indifferent to that. I will say that he was in my first freshman English college textbook. So that was an interesting experience. I hadn't really, I hadn't perceived him well-known enough or popular enough or whatever it takes to be anthologized in a freshman English class, but did I like... Did you know your instructor? Uh, I think I did not because I sometimes I don't want to um, sort of show off, and so I think I kept quiet about that, but I did tell Hank, and we both thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> Nearly... As a Neely, can you hear me? As a as a poet yourself, how important do poets feel uh, it is to get into these canonical texts, these anthologies? And if you don't get into them, 
How do you survive? Oh, I'm sorry, Neil, you're on mute. Oh, Neil, uh, I think Neil has been muted. Neil, can you unmute? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. So what I wanted to okay. do is, um, if you're not going to be in these anthologies, how do poets expect to be read once they pass away? Well, I, you know, I, I just, I'm not sure how to answer that. Why did you become a writer? <clears throat> you know, people think about poets, especially. Are you famous? Are you well known? Somebody hears I'm a writer, a doctor. I met the doctor the other day, for Christ's sake. And someone told her I was a writer. She said, are you famous? That's what they ask. You know, what does this mean? Why did Bob Dylan get the Nobel Prize? I've gone around the world a lot. Asia, Africa, everywhere. I've been everywhere. Everywhere I go, I hear a Dylan record. I hear people refer to him. There's the story right there. He got the Nobel Prize because of reference. All the references. Now, the problem is we run a cliff called Bob Dylan. Suddenly we fall down 4,000 feet and they have somebody named Louise Gluck, who nobody really knows that well. She got a Nobel Prize. And to my mind, it's sort of like Pepto-Bismol. I shouldn't say that, but it is. It's sort of middle-brow poetry. Uh, I don't think Bukowski, uh, you know, he acted like he said one day, there are three famous poets in the world. Two of them are Charles Bukowski. <laughs> I don't know who the third is. You know, he'd make a joke of it. And when he got well known, he'd say, he'd say uh, uh, some other writers, his contemporaries, older people were over and he'd say, Oh, I had three new books out. Oh. And he'd say, yeah, and he, he'd be sort of childishly competitive. But I don't know that that meant so much to him. It doesn't mean a lot to me who's in the canon and who isn't in the canon. What the hell is the canon uh, anyway? I, you know, I go hot and cold on writers. There are some writers who are consistent. My, it doesn't matter. My favorite writer is a tragic figure, and that's Ezra Pound. Somebody Bukowski didn't resonate with at all, but he's a, it was a tragic figure, as a lot of you know, because he had collaborated with the uh, with Mussolini, and and he was put in a madhouse for seventeen years. He was the only political prisoner the United States ever had, and he was kept from getting the Bollingham Prize for years. He was kept out of anthologies. Then they put him back in largely because it all because of his political thing so who's to say you know uh bukowski should be in the anthologies because i would like to see people reading him but what does that mean i like to be in the anthologies because i'd like to see people writing me so it's sort of a I'm, I'm sort of leveling things out you know i'd like people to read those great early uh Bukowski poems, um, my God, uh, you, you know, about what it was like to be in what, what we called East Hollywood, sort of an invention. Those of us who knew Hank, we thought it was East Hollywood. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read something I wrote about an hour ago. And it's very short, but I'm going to read it. It sort of says the issue. Bukowski, they may ask... Bukowski who? And I will say, give me time, simply meaning I have no use for such questions anymore. I'm thinking of my own morality and mortality. I'll say Neruda and Lorca and Rilke and Hart Crane and retreat into my garden where hard green lemons will soon be ripe. I don't mean to be rude. I'll talk chemistry and shadow, salt marsh, and the blue tarmac of L.A. International. What the hell? I'll give you 
a basket full of carnations. So I think that sort of wraps it up, at least for me it does. Thank you for listening. You had to. I, uh, you, you know, <laughs> you know, well, you know, after a certain point, as we say in Hebrew, Dayenu, or you know, Basta in Spanish, enough already. The man should begin the anthologies. The, the, and he's, the fact is, if he isn't, that's fine. People steal his books, they come in the store. I see it all the time. You go in a bookstore. They don't have a poetry section. They have a Bukowski section. And then they have something by Billy Collins. They have Howell by Ginsburg. They have Coney Island of the Mind by Ferlinghetti. And now, for crap's sake, they're going to have Louise Gluck. You well, know. you know, he might not have understood Ezra Pound, but he references him quite a bit because I think as much as any other poet that I know of, he did romanticize the writers of the 1920s and 1930s. He loved those guys. He's constantly referencing Hemingway. He's constantly referencing... Well, let me, let me say, I found Ezra Pound very easy. I, I, I always used to tell my students when I taught, like they asked about Heidegger, I said, Heidegger is easy if you look at him as a poet. And you're only reading it in English anyway. We're getting English. He's very easy. You don't have to be a Heideggerian to read and love Heidegger. You don't have to be a Poundian. But in a, what, what, when you find poetry that seems complex, if it's worth any while at all, you'll look for the simplicity. If you read Charles Bukowski and it seems so country simple, it's really very complex and very deep. And, uh, you know, it, it, it isn't just the... Melrose Avenue going east to west. It's it's the L.A. freeway system, and that's really complex. Mm -hmm. And I mean that. So you know, yeah. those are tricky little deals to deal with. Anyway, well, if you know, it, I think part of us want to believe that he didn't, you know, care about being famous. But for someone who didn't care about being famous, he did an awful lot to become famous. He worked really hard at it. So he oh, really me... worked hard on his image. You know, Kurt, so he, he Kurt, let me say, away from the from fame. Right. Let me just grab on that a minute, Kurt. Charles Bukowski, I said it earlier, he worked so hard. He worked day and night. And when they would dock him at the post office, I was there one day. He said to the guy, Jesus, can't you dock me three more days? <laughs> he wanted the freedom to sit there at the typewriter and you know, he said once the professors come by with their little fucking six packs and they want to know the secret. There isn't any goddamn secret. It's just sitting day by day working the machine. That's it. And then he had envelopes and he put the poems in there. He got hundreds of rejections and he'd start getting those ex uh, those acceptances. And somebody here said, I don't know which one of you, somebody said something about the, the, that existential man alone in the room. You know, I mean, he, en he enjoyed being with other writers, but damn, he enjoyed his privacy because he was able to write. Anyway, that's it. Yeah, thanks. Um, I now want to move to um, Roni. Um, do we make a mistake? when we think of uh, Charles Bukowski as a, a quintessential American uh, writer, we think of him as the heir of the Hemingway style, the writer of the Los Angeles streets, someone who's very American. Is this actually a mistake? Does he really have more of a European sensibility in your opinion? I would say, um Neither. Um, of course, he is an American writer, especially an L.A. writer, because uh, he's, he's very, very typical. Uh, you, you know, uh, he is very rooted in, in the streets of L.A. You can feel it. Um, he's also rooted in, in what you can call a European tradition. And he has read European authors, but he uh, I, I wouldn't believe that he tried to... Uh, work like them uh, he just admired it but to me he's, he's not, uh, not an American author or, or a European author the, the important thing for uh, for an author of world class is uh, to be 
spaceless and timeless. It doesn't matter if his stories are settled in uh, the Los Angeles of the 60s, um, as well as it doesn't matter that uh, Shakespeare writes about uh, kings and princes uh, who don't apply to us anymore in our time, but it's timeless. Uh, what, what Shakespeare writes about, Bukowski didn't like Shakespeare because of these kings and princes, um, but it's the same thing. Um, this, this is just surface, you know, uh, the, the real subject is um, something that us as humans uh, concerns and always will. And this is why Bukowski will be read in a uh, hundred years like he is read now. Um, because great literature is yeah, help my kids who want to be back. Am I exaggerating a little? No, no, um, nothing wrong with extemporating. That's what American jazz musicians do spontaneous. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good Lord. We lost him. Anarchy. <laughs> Keep smiling, Marina. The captain is overboard and the sailors have taken over the ship. <laughs> yeah, right. What are you drinking, Roni? Oh, I... It looks it looks a bit like red wine. Yes. <laughs> so, but I but I try to behave. I waited the first hour to start, and um, I think you're going to edit this part out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you're you're, you're, you're blowing out. our you're blowing our cover as serious scholars here. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Join you if I didn't have to drive after this. I'm at home. <laughs> I'm on the wagon, Ronnie. Oh, poor Several guy. Years I've been on the wagon. How many years? Several. Oh, several. Not bad. I, I don't think there's something bad with drinking. Uh, I just think it's a bad thing to try to be like Bukowski and drink because of that. This is a mistake. A lot, a lot of his fans do. Um, but uh, welcome back, Kirk. <laughs> okay, so I'm, um, let me let let me maybe just to finish it um, say something about the subject uh, that I'm talking about when when I say he's he's existentialist uh, author. Um, all of his protagonists live on an edge, and um, you know one step in the wrong direction and you fall into an abyss, and. Uh, their whole existence is uh, precarious and uh, they are only past pro toto for every one of us. Uh, we all live on an edge and we need to, um, we need to be aware of this. And um, Bukowski shows a radical analysis of society, you know, no sugar cane. And, um, uh, and like, uh, the, the way we treat each other, I think as I said that before, but, but this is really a, a thing. Uh, the way we treat each other is plain brutal. Humanity, mankind is plain brutal. And yes. uh, this, this is what uh, we also read in Schopenhauer or uh, Kafka or Dostoevsky. So he's in a kind of, he's in this tradition and he has read them, uh, but without, but he's not trying to be like them. It's just, the same uh, way of, I wouldn't even say the same mindset, it's the same way of feeling, of suffering from, uh, you know, the con conditio humana. Uh, the essence of our life is a shame, is a dead end. Mm. Like when Bukowski says in, in one of his poems, one tombstone for the mess, I say, humanity, you never had it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So this is Bukowski in a nutshell for you. Okay, I want to turn the question to Abel. I think, um, in my opinion, a lot of the Bukowski readers in the United States 
have not read Dostoevsky. Do not yeah. listen to Beethoven or Brahms yeah. or Haydn. <laughs> right. um, they do not read Schopenhauer or Nietzsche. Do you feel that the European readers um, are different? Let me tell you something, uh, Kurt. I just began teaching in a high school a month ago. Uh, and let me tell you, uh, most students couldn't care less about any form of poetry or literature. They don't give a shit. They are hooked on their phones, on their tablets, and their computers, and their Instagram, and their Facebook, and they couldn't <laughs> care less about literature at all. Right. Spain, United States, India, it's a global pandemic. It's worse than the COVID. So I'm sorry to say, mm -hmm. it's not a good comparison. I know it's not a good comparison, not a good time to say that, but it's yeah. a pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's a pandemic. People don't care. Young, younger generations in Spain, Italy, France, you name it. They don't care for the most part. That's my, my experience in the high school, in the local high school here, but I, I'm sure it happens all over the place. Yeah, I think you're right. Marina... You must um, be approached by a lot of uh, Bukowski fans. Do you feel that they appreciate your father on the level um, that he should be appreciated on? Well, when I'm approached by Bukowski fans, then the answer is generally yes, because I kind of keep a low profile. I don't. I think once in my life, I've actually volunteered the information from someone who didn't ask or know from a friend. Even my close friends don't know for years and, you know, are quite shocked and amazed when they find out. It's not that I'm not proud of my dad. It's that I'm too proud of him. So I feel it's, you know, sort of, I'm not the writer. So why should I run around telling people? <laughs> the cow's daughter if that gives me a crown to wear um but mm -hmm. i once i was in mexico city in a book mm -hmm. full of spanish books and my spanish is terrible so i thought well you know i know my dad's writing pretty well so maybe i can you know with my familiarity maybe i can find uh one of his books that i can practice my spanish so there is no english language stuff there it's a very nice bookstore. And they they said, oh, yes, of course, we have Bukowski when I asked. But then they looked and looked. Maybe they had it on a special secret bookshelf so that the books didn't get stolen. But then I finally felt bad because they were sort of just taking 10 or 15 minutes for them to find the books for me. So I finally volunteered. I wouldn't be putting you through this, but that's my dad. And then they were very excited and amazed and they were taking pictures with me and um, they definitely respected him as what, you know, they're talking to me, so they're not gonna share negative opinions, but they said the phrases like great writer and, you know, philosophically touch them in, an ordinary way that was really extraordinary and special. And then I also, in Mexico, I saw his books in an airport bookstore, which I've never seen in the United States, and I can't really imagine, but it was kind of a nice surprise. So it was a good feeling, and definitely he, he had their respect. Thanks. David. When I, um, when I talk to a lot of uh, professors who don't really know Bukowski's work, they sort of dismiss him as anti-intellectual, whereas I find him as being extremely intellectual and cultured. Do you find this also uh, when you talk to uh, your colleagues about the work that you do on uh, Charles Bukowski? I mean, I think his, his reputation is like as a Neanderthal, this guy who is, he's a drunk. He talks about pissing and he talks about, you know, horses and sex. And I think most of the people who give that opinion are people who have never read him. 
Yeah, no, I think uh, I agree with you. I, I, in, in part, uh, one of the reasons I, I wrote this biography of him, I wanted to counter the notion that he was, uh, you know, what Milt, what, uh, what, did, what did they say Milton said about Shakespeare, piping his native wood notes wild, you know, that he was some sort of, I, I see him as a literary intellectual masquerading <laughs> as as a working class kind of, uh, you know, drinking and sex man. Uh, I think that, I mean, in fact, uh, there's a, I, I, I was, uh, let me just read briefly, actually, this is maybe a good, there's an essay he wrote called, Should We Burn Uncle Sam's Ass? This was, uh, I don't know if that was his title, it was given by, by the publisher, but it was 1970. And this gives you an idea. He's talking about the literature from the, uh, uh, between the wars. He says, Back in the 30s and running right up to World War II, there was a strong revolutionary feeling in this country. Franco was about to take over Spain. Writers were hooked on the noble cause. Hemingway, Kessler, who turned around later, in fact, Darkness at Noon was one of the earliest turnings. Then there was Lillian Hellman, Erwin Shaw, the sweetheart of the intellectuals and the darling of the New Yorker, see the story uh, sailor off the Bremen. And of course, there was Steinbeck and Dos Passos, who turned later, even William Saroyan, who said he'd never go to war, got caught up, went and wrote a very bad novel about it, Adventures of Wesley Jackson. Uh, and he goes on, uh, what happened to Erwin Shaw, Hemingway, Dos Passos, Steinbeck, Saroyan? Uh, and he goes on, he, he, he was quite knowledgeable about literature of the 20s and 30s, just in that little passage. And there's a review also he did of uh, Antonin Artaud, there's the essay about Pound, Ezra Pound, uh, essays about Hemingway. So, and here's another interesting thing. Uh, there was a highbrow, I, I think he's still alive, George Steiner, I don't even know if I'm a famous literary scholar. Uh, uh, Bukowski mentions reading one of Steiner's essays somewhere in like the McKinnon Review. You know, <laughs> George Steiner, I mean, it's pretty highbrow. So I think, uh, yes, I think that uh, people don't realize that about him. And uh, maybe we were talking about before the cultivation of this image, maybe he was too successful in creating that image because, uh, but the same thing that can be said, we said before, Henry Miller, same thing. Uh, Abel was saying, you know, 2% of, of Bukowski is, is, Look at Henry Miller. Everybody knows Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, Sex is... Oh, yes, Henry Miller, he's a dirty writer. Henry Miller is 90% Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, Lao Tzu. I mean, the spiritual quest, you know, Hamsun, uh, Celine, uh, Dostoevsky, that's, that's Henry Miller. He's a, he's a philosophical writer, uh, you know, another genius, I think, another person who's not in the anthologies. So... Let's not blame Bukowski and, and Henry Miller and Soroyan. Let's let's. I'm with Abel. Let's let's blame the ignorant people who haven't bothered to read these people's complete works. You know, they, I've just written a book on Diane de Prima. Same thing. Yeah. Everybody knows her for because of Memoirs of a Beatnik, because it's about sex. You know, but she was uh, also a very deep thinker. So yeah, let's stop feeling guilty let's blame the <laughs> let's well i think one of the reasons that people don't read um certain writers is because we're now in the midst of a cancel culture in the united states at least and i want to ask uh, marina um do you feel that there's been an impact on your father's work because of the cancel culture we've been experiencing in the last decade where rather than have to deal with art people uh like to just dismiss it well i'm probably the wrong person to ask about either um you know the reception of my dad's writing or cancel culture um to be honest i almost didn't decide to participate in this panel because i saw the discussion of cancel culture, which is interesting, but I felt that my dad's writing is fine, that he's always been offensive 
And if you're going to read one thing or go by what you hear about them from someone else, then you wouldn't want to read them. And that won't change with cancel culture. Mm -hmm. And it's maybe a new problem for some other artists, but my dad's writing will be fine. And I don't feel, you know, from, from where I sit, I'm not a teacher. I'm not involved in the literary scene, but from where I sit, his writing is just fine. And he's always been canceled by people and it's not been a problem yet. Why should that change now? Yeah. Uh, Neely, when I was at the University of Connecticut as a graduate student, we had a, a couple professors come to the school and tell us that we shouldn't teach Ezra Pound or we were bad people. Huh. Um, I think I've known people who are happy that they don't have to read Hemingway. They've never read Hemingway, but they're glad they don't have to because they know he's a misogynist, so they just will never read his works. And well, that's, that's, they can cross him off the list. They don't have to worry about him, right? Um, what's your feeling about Bukowski and cancel culture? Um, what is that culture? What is it? Cancel? Cancel culture. The idea that um, if you find something offensive about someone, you can just dismiss their entire body. Yeah, yeah bullshit. Look, let me tell you something. So <laughs> I'm with my partner and I'm hooking up with Bukowski again. What happened was I went in this bookstore and L.A. owned by Red Sadowski. He was an old, crusty New York book dealer who moved out west. And his bookstore, Baroque, was a temple to Bukowski. And I came in and he said, I introduced myself. He said, oh, for Christ's sake, Neely Tchaikovsky, why don't you talk to Hank? I said, oh, we've been out of touch for years. He doesn't want to hear from me. Ah, oh, for Christ's sake. He called him up on the phone. He got up and said, yeah. I said, Hank, it's Neely. He says, Jesus Christ. Man, you don't sound any different. Anyway, we got together a couple times. I think on the third time, I brought Jesse, my partner. Now, you look on some of the Bukowski sites as I have. I was drawn into them over the years. Ah, you're gay. Neely Tchaikovsky's a gay. Yeah, fuck him, blah, blah. So I'm there at the house with Jesse and Bukowski takes me aside and he says, listen, I'm so glad you're with somebody. I hope you guys are staying the night. This is 1984. And we did stay the night and we went to their favorite Mexican restaurant the next day. And then we went out for lunch and then we went home. But meanwhile, Jesse's a psychiatrist. And so Bukowski did say, Jesse, why don't you analyze Neely? And Jesse <laughs> says, why don't you analyze Neely? And Bukowski did a beautiful self-analysis uh, of himself, really. Because in a way, we're very much alike. One thing is we share a very sardonic, if I may say, if I may be so bold, we shall share a very sardonic view of human nature. And I'm wondering how much of that I actually got as a teenager from Bukowski. In other words, we have trouble with trust. There's a lot of things, but here's this guy supposed to be anti-gay. You know, they, they don't want to separate Henry Chinaski from Charles Bukowski. And they, people want to be angry at the past. They want to have an argument with history. And that history could just be 30 minutes earlier when they went to the market and the clerk insulted them, you know, and God help us if the clerk is a member of a minority, because then <laughs> it's even worse, you know. So I read Tolstoy. Tolstoy is the only major Russian writer who was not anti-Semitic. Not only was he not anti-Semitic, he wrote incredible things in favor of the Jews. What, I'm going to stop reading Dostoevsky because he was a nauseating anti-Semite? No way. He was a great writer. His diaries are filled with anti-Semitism. Martin Heidegger was a, was a member of the Nazi party. He was an opportunist. For one year, he served with the party. They thought he was a lunatic. He was too smart for them. But what, I'm going to drop his philosophy and what I get from him because of, no way. 
No, not, no way. So I don't buy any of this at all. Excuse me for being so vociferous. No, I just did. I just did this uh, poems of uh, of uh, Bob Kaufman. The two other editors were were all white. We made sure, and we did it great. We got a great woman to write Deborah Major to write the intro. She's black, but I pointed out the city lights. Well, Bob Kaufman had a Jewish grandfather, which is true. But then in the history of his family, they used the word mixed mulatto. Negro and black to describe his family over about 80 years thing. So it the whole thing is bullshit to me. Okay. Thank you. There you are. Roni, in uh, Germany, do they have the same type of cancel culture that we're experiencing in the United States at the moment? Um, I don't know about the extent of it in the United States, uh, but we do have it in Germany. Uh, so, but I can compare... Uh, if it is the same thing, um, especially young people uh, in their 20s are very aware in, in Germany of, um, well, all these things, you know, gender uh, stuff and things like that, uh, trying to change the, the language. You, in, in English, you don't have the problem with uh, male and female um, forms of, of teacher or student or whatever. In, in Germany, we have different forms and uh, usually if you talk to everybody a group of uh, male and female persons you use the male form yes um, and and this is this is uh, th they are uh, very heavily trying at the moment to change this so um, yeah there there yeah. uh, there's a lot of and also also all these uh, you know, a political correctness uh, thing, like uh, you, you cannot say uh, the German equivalent for Negro anymore, but you have to say the black. And um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, I, I have read uh, books of Martin Luther King in the original language, and he himself uh, uses the word Negro in, on every page, you know. Uh, so sometimes I have the feeling that is it is the... Uh, political correctness people who make these words uh, having a bad meaning because before they were neutral but I'm, I'm going away from uh, from the real subject um, sometimes when I'm when I'm talking about fe uh, with, with feminists about Bukowski and uh, try to explain to them that he was not a, a misogynic right. um, and and give examples then, then sometimes I think that uh, what what would be needed was a uh, extensive critical study, um, collecting all uh, this uh, material uh, as much material as possible uh, to shape the tr uh, true to nature um, uh, image of of Pugarski's relation to women, and. Uh, I, I think maybe this is needed to give them the whole picture and not be so uh, prejudiced uh, because of a few uh, parts that they have read. Um, but this would be a, a huge amount of work and I don't have the energy to do it. And uh, I'm a little bit tired of the subject, but I fear uh, I must do it someday. Thank you. Abel, do you feel that um, the readers of Bukowski um, or the people that come across Bukowski um, might dismiss any of his works if they find parts of it offensive? You know, Kurt, I just had a flash, an idea that came, you know, came across my brain, and I'm going to say it to you. I thought if, if Bukowski is watching us right now, mm -hmm. he's probably laughing his ass off and saying, what is, are these guys talking about? You know, what really matters, like Neely was saying before, is sitting down and writing the next line. That's all there is to it, you know? But, you know, okay. So here uh, uh, in Spain, like uh, like Ronnie was saying before, I think, again, like the, the previous question about um, uh, you mentioned me, uh, 
everything is going global now. So whatever's going on in the States will happen here sooner or later. And it's happening very quickly now. Like, for instance, in the 60s, there was all this counterculture in the United States that yeah. happened in Spain, like maybe five years later than in the States. But right now, everything is so fast, it's happening so fast, everything is going global. So that is the, the, the cancel culture that, that is going on in the States right now. We have, thing, we have something very similar here. I, I, I wouldn't say so radical and so obvious, but it's it's being, you know, politically correct and everything. That's happening here, too. So I don't know if people are going to dismiss his work because of that. It, it depends where you are, who you are, and, 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 and of course, your, your personal taste. But um, a lot of people uh, probably w w will just uh, dismiss his work because he's been accused of being, a, you know, a male chauvinist because part of his work like 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 was saying before a tiny tiny part of his work is a little bit you know about sex about being obscene about not being politically correct about gender about race and a number of things and you know that happened 40 years ago it's and still happening today so and just one minor thing about you keep asking and and, and then you have a point you keep asking about the differences between the United States and Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the funny thing about this, well, funny, kind of funny, I think it was sometime in, in the late 70s, um, somebody said to, to him, why do you think you're more popular in Europe than mm -hmm. you are in the United States? And he used to say the same thing over and over again. He said, Europeans are a hundred years ahead of Americans. <laughs> but that was that was forty years ago. I, I don't, I'm not sure that's you know that's no longer the case. I think as, as I was saying before, everything's going global, and I don't think we are a hundred years ahead of Americans anymore. <laughs> you, I don't know. We'll find out soon. <laughs> Um, the um, I, I agree that I think uh, if Bukowski was watching us, he would think what we're doing is ridiculous. Um, but at the same time, I would argue that I do it because it's fun. So yeah, yeah, sure. I talk about Charles Bukowski, I read Charles Bukowski, I teach Charles Bukowski because I think it's fun. Charles Bukowski went to the racetrack because he thought it was fun. That's okay. Yeah, you know, sure. I think we should do what we think is fun. To me, this is fun. So sure. you thank all of you for uh, coming to this symposium, giving your views. And what I'd like to end on is have each of you um, read something that uh, really touches you by uh, Charles Bukowski. I'd like to start with uh, David. So could you please uh, read a passage <laughs> of Bukowski in honor of his 100th birthday, um, the centenary and... Um, Thank you guys so much for participating. I'd like you all to uh, choose something to read for everybody out there as we close this uh, virtual symposium. Uh, this is a poem called 1813 to 1883. Listening to Wagner as outside in the dark, the wind blows a cold rain, the trees wave and shake, lights go off and the walls creak and the cats run under the bed. Wagner battles the agonies. He's emotional but solid. He's a supreme fighter, the giant in a world of pygmies. He takes it straight on through. He breaks barriers, an astonishing force of sound as everything here shakes, shivers, bends, blasts in fierce gamble. Yes, Wagner and the storm intermix with the wine as nights like this run up my wrists and up into my head and back down into the gut. Some men never die, and some men never live. We're all alive tonight. I don't know if I could cheat. I struggled this morning whether to read an earlier or a later poem. My first idea was to read an earlier poem, which is much more kind of sad. Do you mind if I read one more? Yeah, I could. read another one. 
1958 called The Hunted. Mm. The ants are coming across the arms of chairs at me. A man climbs in the shell of the radio and downstairs somebody walks nervously on the cement, staring up at my window and hating some living part of me. I am frightened away from my sea and I am frightened up here, alone like some godless monk stuck in a cell. I lift a glass and drink the dog's pure night howl, and the last of two eyes, like sun-banged webs, come into the structure before me, and a face looks out and drinks and smiles behind the mouth of a howl, behind the dull, thick snout, his nostrils like plagues, behind a man tossed like a bone into a cat-scratched tomb. I turn and look at the fan in the corner. It turns and twists and whirls, and I still hear the footsteps. They stop and listen for me in some silly night corner. And across the huts and harks of seven or eight corners of nothing, they grow gnome-like, clothed and menacing. And I hold my side, angry, bent and thin under the electric sheen. and wonder, what do they want with me? What the hell do they want with me? Thank you, David. It occurs to me that, you know, the real important thing for this centenary is the work. And uh, Roni, can you uh, read us something by Bukowski that, that really touches oh, you? Of course I can. Um, I wasn't sure what to read. And um, I, I'm still about to decide between a newer one, which is one page, mm -hmm. and an old one, which is two pages. Well, I think, I think um, it was Gregory Corso who said, if you have a decision between two things and you can't make up your mind, do both. Take them both. <laughs> Great, <laughs> thank both. you. Um, well, I start with the old one. It's called everything. The dead do not need aspirin or sorrow, I suppose, but they might need rain. What? Spaghetti, did you have one? Not shoes, but a place to walk. Not cigarettes, they tell us, but a place to burn. Mm. Or, we are told, space and a place to fly might be the same. The dead don't need me, nor do the living. But the dead might need each other. In fact, the dead might need everything we need. And we need so much if we only knew what it was. It is probably everything. And we will all probably die trying to get it or dying because we don't get it. I hope you will understand when I am dead, I got as much as possible. Hmm. So that was the old one. And now here's one uh, <laughs> from, from the mid eighties. No luck for that. Uh, the the uh, version collected during his lifetime uh, was uh, no help for that. But I'm, I'm reading the version that Abel has um, collected in his book, which follows an earlier manuscript. No luck for that. There is a place in the heart that will never be filled, a space. And even during the best moments and the greatest of times, we will know it. We will know it more than ever. There is a place in the heart that will never be filled. And we will wait and wait in that space. That's true. Well, thank you, Roni. Abel, I think you and I will agree. Um, most important thing is the work, right? We yeah. want to get uh, we want to get it out there. We want um, people to uh, hear it and maybe be inspired and appreciate it. Um, 
Can you read us something about that um, inspires you written by Charles Bukowski? Sure. Um, Thing is, one of my uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite poems ever. It's like uh, it's called "We ain't got no We ain't got no money, honey, but we got rain." But problem is, it's about fifteen page long, so I'm not gonna read that one. But it's one of my favorite poems. It's about the depression in the in the United States and his experiences. Uh -huh. about when he was a kid with his family and everything and everyone uh, unemployed and the rain pouring down for a week nonstop. It's a beautiful to me moving poem that you can read out loud and it, and it feels like a short story more than a poem. So it's beautiful, but it's too long. So I'm going to read uh, another poem, which is even not more moving but it's very 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 short and i really like it and it's called um uh, it's called art and it goes like this and it says art as the spirit wanes the form appears and that is that <laughs> That's beautiful. thank you Abel. all right nearly yeah We'd like you to oh. read some Bukowski for us in honor you kinda, of the centenary. Well, you kind of threw me when you said 100th anniversary of his birthday. Bless his soul. And uh, thank you to you, Kurt, and to uh, uh, all the, the you participants. Every, they make, you, you all make me feel like it's worthwhile, if you don't mind my saying, to talk about Bukowski the way we have. And Marina, it's so good to see you. I do want to say before I read the poem, we used to sit there at DeLongpre and we talk literature all the time. And he could be like a professor, let me tell you. I mean, that <laughs> guy was vitally interested in Hemingway, Faulkner, William Saroy, and the daring young man of the flying trapeze, John Fonte. Um, um, you know, and, yeah, I mean, I mean, and Dostoevsky and, uh, you know, Notes of a Dirty Old Man, uh, you know, but, you know, we could be sitting there and it's absolute silence and suddenly I'd hear him, he'd say, Hemingway, mm. just the word Hemingway. And I'd say, Thomas Wolfe, you can't go home again. And he'd say, uh oh, it's running out of uh, it's running out. I'm going to read the poem if it'll finish. Otherwise, I'm going to say goodbye. Crucifix and a death hand. I love this poem for many reasons. For one, is that it starts out in nature, something that Hank rarely did. Yes, they begin out in a willow. The starch mountains begin out in the willow and keep right on going without regard for pumas and nectarines. Somehow these mountains are like an old woman with a bad memory and a shopping basket. We are in a basin. That is the idea down in the sand and the alleys, this land punched in cuffed out, divided, held like a crucifix in a death hand. This land bought, resold, bought again, and sold again. The war is long over. The Spaniards all the way back in Spain, down in the thimble again. And now real estaters, subdividers, landlords, freeway engineers arguing this is their land, and I walk on it, live on it for a little while near Hollywood here. I see young men in rooms listening to glazed recordings, and I think, too, of old men, sick of music, sick of everything, and dead like suicide, I think is sometimes voluntary. And to get your hold on the land... It is best to return to the Grand Central Market. See the old Mexican women, the poor. I am sure 
you have seen these same women many years before arguing with the same young Japanese clerks, witty, knowledgeable, and golden among their soaring stores of oranges, apples, avocados, tomatoes, cucumbers, and you know how these look. They do look good. So if you could eat them all, light a cigar, and smoke away the bad world, then it's best to go down to the bars, the same bars, wooden, stale, merciless, green, with the young policeman walking through, scared and looking for trouble. And the bees is still bad. It has an edge that already mixes with vomit and decay and you've got to be strong in the shadows to ignore it to ignore the poor and to ignore yourself and the shopping bag between your legs down there feeling good and it's avocados and oranges and fresh fish and wine bottle who needs a Fort Lauderdale winter? 25 years ago, there used to be a whore with a film over one eye who was too fat and made little silver bells out of cigarette tinfoil. The sun seemed warmer then, although this was probably not true. And you take your shopping bag outside and walk along the street and the green beer hangs there just above your stomach like a short and shameful shawl and you look around and no longer see any old men. All right. Thank you, Neely. I knew Neely would read something from the old days, so I wanted to read one of his later poems. This is called The Secret of My Endurance. I still get letters in the mail mostly from cracked up men in tiny rooms with factory jobs or no jobs who are living with whores or no woman at all. No hope, just booze and madness. Most of their letters are on line paper written with an unsharpened pencil or an ink in tiny handwriting that slants to the left. And the paper is often torn, usually halfway up the middle. And they say they like my stuff. <laughs> I've written from where it's at. And they recognize that, truly. I've given them a second chance, some recognition of where they're at. It's true. I was there. Worse off than most of them. But I wonder if they realize where their letters arrive. Well, they are dropped into a box behind a six-foot hedge with a long driveway leading to a two-car garage. Rose garden, fruit trees, animals, a beautiful woman, mortgage about half paid after a year, a new car, fireplace and a green rug two inches thick with a young boy to write my stuff now. I keep him in a 10 foot cage with a typewriter, feed him whiskey and raw whores, belt him pretty good three or four times a week. I'm 59 years old now and the critics say, my stuff is getting better than ever. <laughs> One of the things I love about Charles Bukowski the most is the way that he writes about you, Marina. And this is one of my favorite poems he wrote for you. This one's just called Marina. Majestic, magic, infinite, my little girl is sun on the carpet, out the door, picking a flower. Huh. An old man, battle wrecked, emerges from his chair. He looks at me, but only sees love. Huh. And I become quick with the world 
freaking love right back, just like I was meant to do. Marina, can uh, you read us one of uh, your dad's poems and tell us what it was like uh, to be his daughter uh, to conclude our symposium? Just a hearing you read that. Uh, really. You're calling a robot. Did you have spaghetti ready? Tree? But I really enjoyed how you read it, and that was us. That's how. Okay. Um, yeah. The thing that seems like a straight. Maybe, maybe we should make uh, Neely aware that. that uh, or maybe you hear the whole background. Yeah. You cannot really hear you, Marina. <laughs> oh, Neely. I think as host, you can probably hit mute for him. Becoming Zoom person these days, right? Yeah, of course, should uh, be able to do this. To mute him. <laughs> Okay, I think I got it. I see how that goes. Oh, you did it. This one is called Starting Fast. We each time should remember the most elevated and lucky moment of our lives. For me, it was being a very young man and sleeping penniless and friendless on a park bench in a strange city, which doesn't say much for all the many decades which followed. Well, the ending is funny, but I love that poem because I remember him talking about, you know, he told stories about his life all the time, right? But he talked about that day when he woke up on that park bench. He's not just using it as a random example that really was one of the luckiest and best feeling moments of his life. And it stayed with him. And I try to do the same when they happen, right? You don't necessarily expect it when you wake up on a park bench. But if it happens, you just grab a hold of it and hang on. Um, what was it like to have as a father, the poem pretty much covers it. I felt, um, especially when I was a young child, I felt like I was the center of the universe and my dad made me feel safe in the world. He didn't, um, he didn't tell me that safe place but he was always there for me. And he talked to me about what to expect, like you would talk to a friend, not like you would talk to a child. So we discussed some pretty heavy subjects at times. And um, he, was, he was a very gentle, loving father. And as an adult and as a mother now, I realize how hard that is when you are in crazy moments as a parent, you sometimes hear things coming out of your mouth that came from mistakes your own parents made. <laughs> and yeah. Ver even raised his voice at me. He called yelling, or what I reacted to as yelling would be him just saying, Now, Marina, that's all it took. I cared about him and he cared about me. I think I'm able to be a happy person because of that feeling of safeness in the world that he gave me. And I I have that forever. That's my park bench. That's a great a way to end this symposium. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I feel just honored to be in the presence of all of you guys. Thank you so much for participating. This is certainly the most impressive uh, Bukowski panel I've ever heard of. And I hope one day we can all get together in, in person and have drinks um, in celebration of all the great work that you guys do and, you know, uh, the things that we love. Um, and I think Neely will appreciate. I think it isn't. I think it's Ezra. 
your your uh, your friend Ezra Pound, who says <laughs> what um, what you love best is what you uh, is what you'll you'll keep and take away. So, thank you so much for being part of this symposium, and enjoy. I can't wait for the coronavirus to be over and for us to get back to our normal lives. Thank you for everyone out there who is watching. Take care. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Been a pleasure. No more. It was, it was great meeting you again, Marina, Abel, David, meeting you first time.